When training for strength, there are a variety of methods that can be used to monitor and adjust the intensity of traditional resistance training exercise, such as linear loading, the two for two rule, percentage of one repetition maximum, repetition maximum zones, rating of perceived exertion and reps in reserve, set repetition best, auto-regulatory progressive resistant exercise, and velocity-based training. The article, published in the journal Sports Medicine, titled Training for Muscular Strength, Methods for Monitoring and Adjusting Training Intensity, by Timothy Suchamel and colleagues, evaluated the efficiency of these monitoring methods and provided recommendations for their use. This presentation, brought to you by Talking Sports Science, will provide a summary of their recommendations. First of all, linear loading refers to gradually increasing training loads beyond those encountered in previous training sessions. While linear loading may be beneficial to make strength gains for a brief period, if implemented over a couple of months, it will eventually impair your ability to recover and adapt from training, potentially leading to a plateau in performance, non-functional overreaching, and if continued, can lead to overtraining. So because linear loading is driven by continual upward load adjustment, it's limited in its use as a monitoring tool because it does not include enough variation in training to account for the accumulated fatigue. Moving on to the two for two rule, which refers to increasing the amount of weight for an exercise when you can perform two or more reps over the prescribed repetition goal in the last set in two consecutive training sessions. Therefore, the monitoring and adjusting of training load for this method is based on completing the assigned number of reps. This approach may allow novice athletes to increase their muscular strength. However, it has some disadvantages, as it may promote training to failure at the expense of exercise technique. Therefore, if an athlete can perform two or more repetitions with good technique over what's being prescribed during consecutive training sessions, it may be beneficial to modify the loads each set instead of prescribing the same load every set. And lastly, to achieve a progressive overload stimulus from one week to the next, performing repetitions beyond what was prescribed may be by design. Moving on to percentage of one repetition maximum. A one repetition maximum is traditionally established by identifying the heaviest weight that can be lifted with proper technique for one repetition. It can also be estimated using the heaviest mass lifted for multiple repetitions. For example, 95% 1RM is equal to 2RM. However, predicting 1RM becomes less valid with higher repetitions. Once 1RM is determined, resistance training intensities are prescribed as a percentage of 1RM according to the number of reps performed in a set and the specific training goals being targeted. While using 1RM to adjust and prescribe intensity is perhaps the most common method used, there are drawbacks. Firstly, 1RM is dynamic and fluctuates in response to factors relating to training such as accumulated fatigue, sleep deprivation, nutrition and just general life stresses. Also, considerable variation in maximum repetition performed at a given percentage of 1RM can exist between athletes and between exercises at the same percentage of 1RM as the number of repetitions performed is influenced by the amount of muscle mass involved in the exercise, which may lead to an inconsistent training stimulus and therefore different rates of adaptations. However, this is not to say that percentage of 1RM should be eliminated as a form of prescribing resistance training intensity. Rather, it's recommended that this approach be combined with other load adjustment methods. For example, an athlete may select the heaviest load that can be lifted for a given repetition range with the goal of reaching muscular failure on the final set of the exercise, known as repetition maximum zones. The advantages of using this approach is that it removes the limitations of percentage of 1RM as the loads selected are adjusted according to the current physiological status of the athlete for each exercise, and loads can be prescribed without the need of 1RM testing, making it appealing when working with large groups of athletes. However, while improvements in maximum strength have been reported using RM zones, there are a few disadvantages. For example, repetition maximum zones require a constant relative maximum effort, which is problematic when aiming to develop power 
which is optimised by implementing a mixed methods approach through both heavy and light days. By using RM zones, the use of light days are disregarded as every training session becomes a heavy training day as sets are performed to failure. Also, chronic training to failure makes fatigue management very difficult, which may result in non-functional overreaching or overtraining. Moving on to rating of perceived exertion and repetitions in reserve. The original rating of perceived exertion scale developed by Borg ranges from 6 to 20, however a simplified version of the scale now includes values ranging from 0 to 10. Despite its aerobic training origins, rating of perceived exertion can be used to assess the perception of resistance training intensity of each set, as well as an entire resistance training session, i.e. session RPE. RPE can also be used for longitudinal monitoring purposes, however the focus here will be on the use of RPE following individual sets and its relationship to estimated repetitions in reserve with reps in reserve being the number of reps you have left in the tank after completing a set, i.e. how many more reps could have been completed before reaching failure. In practice, RPE and estimated reps in reserve often entails providing resistance training intensities in the form of ranges. For example, an athlete may be assigned three sets of five repetitions with one to two estimated repetitions in reserve, or the corresponding RPE value of eight to nine rather than percentage of 1RM. In reality, percentage of 1RM may be used to identify a desired training load for a session, an RPE and estimated repetitions in reserve used to adjust the load as a means of auto-regulation. When this approach is taken, it can be used to ensure that each athlete is lifting a load within the same proximity to their relative maximal capacity. The main limitation of RPE and estimated repetitions in reserve is the potential for under-reporting by athletes. For example, despite reaching failure during an individual set, which should represent an RPE value of 10, some athletes have been known to report sub-maximal values. Also, the ability to gauge exertion accurately may be influenced by training experience. Therefore, it's recommended to limit autonomy when selected training loads with untrained athletes until they display proficiency in reporting accurate RPE and estimated repetitions in reserve. However, this may not occur until near maximal loads are experienced during training. Another limitation includes the reduced estimated repetitions in reserve accuracy during higher repetition sets, for example, above 12 repetitions, as well as lower relative intensities, for example, above 4 repetitions in reserve. This reduced ability to accurately monitor and adjust intensity with lighter training loads, like RM zones, may be problematic for power development, as training in this manner may prevent the ability to use heavy and light days. However, as mentioned earlier, this can be addressed by combining RPE and estimated repetitions in reserve with other methods, like percentage of 1RM. Moving on to set repetition best which is used to prescribe relative intensities in which an athlete's maximum weight is established based on their performance of a given set repetition scheme. Set repetition best may be used to adjust an athlete's maximal loads on a weekly basis depending on the loads completed during previous training sessions. The 5% range allows for observations and a degree of auto-regulation and confirmation. From a practical perspective, Set repetition best loads are typically based on percentages of the repetition maximum of the prescribed repetitions. For example, a prescription of 90% of three sets of five repetitions is based on 90% of an athlete's three sets of 5RM weight. Loads may be estimated when switching from one set repetition scheme to another. Here's an example of approximate percentage changes for squat and pull exercises for various set repetition schemes, as percentage change in load from three sets of two repetitions. For upper body exercises, it's recommended to consider using approximately 10% lower alterations in percentage changes, and there may be a decrease of approximately 10% from an individual's assessed 1RM to their 3x2 load. It's worth highlighting 
that the maximum load estimated is based on ideal conditions, meaning that the athlete has been developing strength qualities specific to a given set repetition range for some time. In terms of implementing set repetition best, it's recommended to load conservatively in the early stages, especially with novice athletes, before progressing in subsequent weeks. For example, using a 3 to 1 weekly loading paradigm for strength development, the first three weeks may allow for jumps in load to be made as more observations take place and input from the athlete is received. However, if a basic strength block follows a strength endurance block, starting certain exercises, for example the back squat, with the heaviest weights performed in the previous block, may be a good starting point before progressing in the subsequent weeks. A practical aspect of percentages set repetition best is that it has a built-in goal-setting component in which the athlete becomes aware of their bests for various set rep schemes and can plan on surpassing them in the future. In this regard, percentage of set repetition best may serve as a monitoring tool to determine if an athlete is responding to the training stimulus as expected or if training needs to be adjusted to prevent maladaptation. Typically, athletes can become accustomed to percentage of set repetition best within three to eight weeks. Moving on to autoregulatory progressive resistant exercise, which may be defined as resistance training exercise that is adjusted to an individual's day-to-day -day training readiness. The first model of APRE was used to treat orthopaedic injuries from World War II and since then has undergone various adaptations. The most recent one is based on a four-set protocol with the use of three loading methods, APRE10, APRE6, and APRE3, which use different percentages of an athlete's 10RM, 6RM and 3RM respectively, and emphasise the development of specific physical characteristics. For example, APRE10 for hypertrophy, APRE6 for hypertrophy and strength, and APRE3 for strength and power. Based on the repetitions performed during the third set, using the load adjustment chart, the fourth set requires the athlete to either decrease, maintain or increase the load. Compared to linear loading, APRE may stimulate greater strength adaptations and may serve as an effective monitoring and a load adjustment method for healthy and rehabilitating athletes. However, further research is needed which compares APRE to other loading methods. Other factors that should be considered include technical failure, psychological momentum and alteration to the load adjustment chart. Firstly, when performing reps to failure, it's important that proper technique is maintained during repetitions. If an individual sacrifices proper technique to complete additional repetitions, the set should be stopped. Secondly, APRE adjustment protocols may be used as a motivational tool for athletes in the weight room. For example, if an athlete becomes familiar with the adjustment protocols, they may be motivated to perform an additional repetition so that they can increase the weight lifted during the next training session. Lastly, when using APRE protocols, despite the recommended increases and decreases in weight, the load on the barbell should be put into context with regard to the athlete's maximal strength. For example, adding 5 to 7.5 kilograms may be a greater increase in relative load for some compared to others. Therefore, the adjustment protocols should be modified accordingly. And last but not least, velocity-based training, which is the measurement of movement velocity of resistance exercises and requires the use of equipment, such as a linear position transducer, that measures and calculates metrics, such as barbell displacement and velocity. Velocity-based training can be used to provide real-time feedback, daily 1RM predictions, and velocity loss thresholds. Regarding real-time feedback, this may increase an athlete's motivation due to a more competitive weight room environment. However, this may result in sacrificing technique to achieve higher velocities. In terms of recommendations, feedback should be provided consistently during exercise sets and is best implemented with heavy load, multi-joint movements, such as the squat or velocity-focused exercises for example, jump variations. 
since lifting velocity has been shown to decrease as external load increases and continues until the maximum velocity is achieved, velocity-based training may be used to predict daily 1RMs, allowing daily training percentages to be based on the athlete's current training state. However, an athlete may not give maximal effort during their warm-up repetition, resulting in an underestimation of their daily 1RM. And it's possible that load velocity profiles may overestimate a 1RM. Also, additional time may be needed to determine exercise load velocity profiles, especially with a large group of athletes, and when multiple exercises are performed each week. In terms of recommendations, despite both general and individualised equations having limitations, general equations that use the velocity at 1RM from all athletes are recommended to help simplify low velocity assessments. And it should be noted, estimated 1RM from two loads, for example 40 and 85% of 1RM, may be useful for upper body exercises, but not for lower body exercises. When completing traditional exercise sets, repetitions are performed at a given load until the prescribed number of repetitions are completed. However, due to fatigue towards the end of the set, large drops in velocity may occur. Therefore, velocity-based training can be used to set velocity thresholds to help monitor fatigue during single or multiple exercise sets. This may allow for the use of flexible repetition schemes that use barbell velocity as an objective measurement of exercise intensity rather than a standard set repetition scheme. However, it's important to recognise that flexible repetition schemes may alter the training stimulus and outcome of the training undertaken. For example, accumulation training phases may warrant the maintenance of the greatest velocity despite a drop below a certain threshold. Also, like predicting daily 1RMs, it may take time to establish velocity baselines and additional time may be needed with more frequent load adjustments. And that concludes the methods that can be used to monitor and adjust intensity during resistance training. So linear loading and the 2 for 2 rule may be beneficial for novice athletes given that their exercise technique and relative strength may change daily. However, these methods provide little variation and may be detrimental if used exclusively for long periods of time. Whereas the use of percentage of one repetition maximum and repetition maximum zones may provide athletes with more variation and greater potential for strength and power adaptations, although they fail to account for daily changes in performance capabilities. However, an athlete's daily readiness can be addressed at various levels by both subjective, for example, RPE and repetitions in reserve, set repetition best and auto-regulatory progressive resistant exercise, and objective load adjustment methods, for example, velocity-based training. Therefore, it might be that a combination of methods are used to provide a greater insight into an athlete's training state. Nevertheless, it's important to understand the advantages and disadvantages of each method in order to select an approach that works from both a practical and financial standpoint. Lastly, the addition of load adjustment and monitoring methods should not take away the importance from actual coaching of lifts. Instead, they should be used to supplement and guide what is being seen during coaching and provide longitudinal data to assist in athletic development. And that concludes this presentation. As always, I recommend you check out the full article. The link is in the description. Thanks for listening, folks. See you next time.